there was a time for two weeks, literally two weeks, I would eat the gardenia, wholemeal bread and water for two weeks okay. in my life. And you were still running the, the bread and mortar business. That's yeah. <laughs> All right, so we're back on our next uh, episode of the Property Brothers podcast. Welcome back to our Property Brothers studio. And today we're very excited because we have a digital marketing expert, uh, Esmond. <laughs> yeah, he's Thank the, you for having me, Melvin. Right, he's the co-owner of um, this digital marketing agency sure. uh, called Neo360, which is also the top 12 in- uh, Asia Pacific. Right, Asia Pacific. And right. um, Esmond is, is, a, is a good friend. And uh, today I've invited him here to talk um, a little bit about his, um, you know- uh, My journey. His journey <laughs> on his business. Yes. As a very young person, later I'll let you guess what age he is. And I'm 18. Um, we're going to talk about digital marketing <laughs> and stuff, right? So, Esmond, what do yeah, you give, be uh, fun. Yeah, yep. give us a bit of intro about yourself? Sure. Right. Uh, my name is Esmond and I run a digital marketing agency. I serve as the creative director, the co-owner, and we run a business that helps other businesses solve their problem by elevating their brand, creating peak performance in their marketing campaigns, right. and fueling the growth of their sales. So, think of us as a strategic and creative agency digital agency that helps businesses make more money right so now he can. started his business at the age of 21 if i'm right that's five years back this business yes this right business, yeah. right and um why don't you share with us like you know um what made you wanted to to go into the digital space to start your own business sure as, as a as a very young business owner mm. and, and what was your background okay so I come, I used, I was in sports initially. Right. Um, growing up, I was in boxing and then I was in athletics. Boxing? Yeah, I was in well. boxing and athletics. So <laughs> the interesting thing is I was in my school's, um, high school athletic team. I was the captain of my school. Right. My parents were against me doing any form of martial arts or uh, combat sports. Right. But for some reason, I just really, w I was really intrigued and I felt very, thrill every time I watch boxing. And back then there wasn't even the UFC as big as it is today. So it was only boxing. Right. And boxing was like dance as well. It's not about the hands actually. It's really about from the legs. Um, it's, it's, that's why they call it the sweet science, right? Right, right. And uh, I used to go and train behind my parents' back. Okay. So I would go to school and after school, if I don't have a CCA, mom and dad, I'm sorry, but uh, <laughs> they, they, they found about it. They found out about it eventually because back then there was only one school, um, right. Kadiru Boxing School, and I was there for a bit. I right. did well, so I was doing. I was in competitions. Then I was in my school's um, athletic team. I would represent C Division, B Division. I was my school captain. So naturally, I would have thought that I would go into sports. Right, and, and that was um, uh, in your junior was, college day or secondary? No, that was like 13 to 16. Wow, okay. Yeah, so in your secondary school days. Yes, right. secondary school, high school. Right. So right after that, when I was about 15, things started to change. I was really, because I was, I was very big on like, um, you know, personal growth, personal development. I read books. Um, right. And because of my faith as well. So I started to think like, what do I actually really want to do in my life? Like right. what, what? what is my purpose? Why am I here? Why am I studying all these things in school? Am I really going to apply it? Right. Then I realized that I love to express. I love to dance, do sports because it's physical. Right. And I like to get results. I must get results. I will always want to get results. Right. Then I thought, okay, um, boxing is it's quite risky. Mm. There's not much support, not much funding, especially in boxing. Mm. Then I thought, okay, what about arts? Because I was good in humanities, in language. And what I liked was the the resources or the opportunities to actually be in acting or any form of art. Right. So I found out, I was literally um, walking around Middle Road because mm. I, the only school I knew that existed was Nafa. Mm. Then I saw this super artsy school, it looked really nice and I was like, what, what school is this? And it was La Salle and it was the new campus. Right. So what I did was um, right after O levels, um, when everyone was going to JC and Poly and IT, I was literally like the only student that went to audition and get into La Salle. And I will, <laughs> I, I, I'm still surprised still today that I got selected after the audition because right. I'm not from an arts background. Right. So Initially, you just walk in, just just go I, straight yeah, without I any applied. background. Yeah, exactly. And even the person that was um, talking to me, the person, the the, the the judges, so you call it or auditioners, I'm not sure. Uh, they were asking me, so why do you want to be in arts? You were from sports. Right. But eventually, yeah, they took me in. I was in arts. I really enjoyed it. Um, I did everything from music, dance, acting. Well, the major was actually film and acting. Mm. So I did theater. I did 
um, on screen, off screen, and while I was there, because I don't come from a good background, mm. um, my parents never really had money to support me, so I actually had to pay for my own education in Lasalle. Right. So if I was not Lasalle doesn't give you scholarships easily. Right. And I'm not from an arts background, so I didn't get a scholarship. Right. And when I was in school, I was 16. I was working as a bar boy. I was a bar boy, you know, making drinks. I was a bartender. Right. I worked at Holland Village. It was my... I, I probably worked at, like, at least five different bars at Holland Village. Right. And I was underage. You know, I'm not supposed to be actually serving <laughs> alcohol, but let's not go there. Um, they hired me, <laughs> so I worked there. And I remember vividly... I would think I was about... 17, 18, mm. 17, 18. Um, I was working and I was enjoying it. I love to express peak, right? So I was good in sales and I was able to listen. Like I would always listen to what the customers want, give them options, give them su suggestions, um, ask them the right questions. So, you know, even the F&B, there's upsell, cross-sell, all these kind of things. So right, I was good at right. it. Then this one day, this man, he, 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 he will always wear gray, gray color. Um, right. If he's watching this, I gotta give him a big thank you because he gave me my first business opportunity. Right. He was a wealthy man who was really down to earth and simple, but he saw that I was always, you know, working um, shifts late at night. Mm. At Holland Village. School, yeah, at Holland Village. So he came to me and he said, hey, um, okay, I have this business. Don't ask me too much, but this is what I need. I need to move this business from this location at Holland Village, um, you know the Hawker Center at Holland Village, yes, right? Yes. Opposite, there used to be this business called Video Easy. It's an right. Australian franchise, if I'm not yes, wrong. Yes, I, I think I heard that before. Yeah, you probably would have right. rented or bought movies from there. So yeah. he said that he needs to move it to a smaller location. Mm. Something like what you just did, you know, like shifting, moving location. Right. But he said, okay, I need someone there. I need someone responsible. I need someone to do it. And you are from acting, I heard. You're from acting. You're from an art school. Right. Do you know about movies and music? I said, yes, I love mu movies and music. I know everything, like all the European films, all the 50s, 60s, Citizen Kane, whoever, all the old actors. Right. Um, so I, I, I will be able to help you out. He said, right. okay, I'll, I'll do whatever needs to be done um, mm. in terms of funding the new location. Right. But you need to do everything else yourself. Right. You have to move all the DVDs and the CDs and you have to set up the operations, you hire your own part-timers, whatever. Just make sure I get the revenue and there's profit and you take a cut out of it. So I said, okay, right. cool. So I spent about a month, I, I remember vividly, and it was around end of November till December of mm. the year. Mm. Um, I was moving everything late at night. And uh, you know, there's a cold storage at Holland Road, right? The right. Stand yes. Mine was, I think it was on the third floor. Right. In fact, my, the neighbors there, they're still there till today. They've okay. been there since the 70s. So they remember, they've seen me grow, right? So it's really interesting. And I was doing that business and it was great because this was like 2013 till 2014. Right, that was like uh, <coughs> seven, six, seven years back. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. six, right. seven years back. And right. business was good. CDs and DVDs were still a great source of entertainment right. so that was my first business experience um, I did things a little bit differently so usually when you go into a movie store right. what they do is they keep it like a library right? right they would put it according to alphabet or according to genre right right but I noticed that every time customers walked into the store they would go to a particular section that they actually enjoy so if they're 15 16 year olds come in they will go to romantic they want the right. romantic they want the uh, more cliche, a bit sexually driven content. Right. Then you have the house, um, what do you call that? The helpers right. that will come in and they will take like five, six CDs for the elderly. Okay. Then you all have right. the couples that will come in and take. So I noticed all these things like who like action, who like horror, who like this, who like that. So I actually separated them according to what you call today target audience. Right, like the niche. Yeah, right. niche. So that when they walk in, it minimizes their time. They go exactly where they want to go, they get what they want and they leave. Right, And right. so that kind of helped business. Um, and I was doing some sales promotions. Back then, 2013, I wasn't really aware of um, social media marketing yet. Right. So it was still the conventional way of giving out flyers, walking out there. Right. Um, building rapport, relationship with like people in their supermarket, in the, at the bars, wherever. 
or the customers that I had previously. Right. So so the that that kind of uh, mm. brick and mortar kind of business exactly. in the young days. Exactly. Yeah. Actually help you yes. uh, to learn about building businesses and, yes, and that yes. gives you a lot of ideas and stuff along the way. Right, right. Right. And the thing is I had no idea that what I was doing was business. Like as as ironic and as amusing as it sounds to me it was more of i enjoy doing this it's giving me income mm. and i'm constantly leveling up and i'm improving the business but i had no idea that what i was doing was sales was targeting was branding right. this is entrepreneurship i didn't i didn't know all that right. i was just a 18 17 18 year old doing what i loved after school late at night uh, besides the bar right it's not just like yeah. you know working for for yeah to, to manage the yeah. shop and, and stuff like a exactly. manager and stuff exactly I right felt like i was there uh, manager then i hired two part-timers two goals right the kind of yeah it was it was quite fun so yeah. how, how long was that was that oh was that, that, that was about nine to ten months it was unfortunately short-lived <laughs> <laughs> what happened what happened to the business <laughs> after that so <laughs> so things were going really well right there were sales um, customers kept coming back they were referring people and saying hey go to this small shop i kind of like rebranded certain things and right. all then for the first time in my life, I heard Netflix and I also heard on <laughs> Spotify. Right. And I was like, what's these two platforms? Like, and I'm not a tech person. I'm not someone that works with the laptop. You see, I was in sports, mm. I was in arts. You don't use the laptop or desktop in these right. two. Right. You never have to use it. Right. So I didn't use really your body. do Yeah, use body it's always about physically expressing and working and right. doing things, right? It's right. always about this. And I didn't do much research, but I started to see that there was a decline like right. after the ninth month there's a decline in the i think business. actually around seven or eight months it started going down so it was really high right. it had its peak they started dipping right so i realized what was happening so i went to do research and found out that okay these two are the mega platforms coming up one for movies entertainment right. another one is for music right and spotify is going to take over itunes right so i was quite um i felt quite upset right then i realized okay i have a choice right now Maybe I should move on, take everything that I've learned and move on to a something online, something digital. Right. And I l always believed in the idea of know what your customers want mm. and give it to them. Minimize their time and energy and give them exactly what they want. Mm. So you please them, they are happy, you're happy. Right. So I thought, okay, how about I take this online? So I went to do some research and I found out about social media marketing. Right. So back then I used to have an old Instagram account, not mm. my current one. It was mm. my old one. There were sports and arts. Mm. And back then, um, Instagram's algorithm was very different. Like it would really push out your content very quickly, you know, and right. you, that's how you build your followers when you keep posting. And so I had relatively quite a high uh, followers. Right. And I was like, wow, so this actually works. This right. is organic. So what is social media marketing like what, what do you mean by marketing through social media right so i did research then i my friend i had this really good friend that uh, was in this business for a bit as well so he, there were some courses available online mm. and then i took some of the courses but while i was learning the course right i was i, I couldn't believe it like really you can you can get traffic like that you can entertain you can do so much of strategic creative things you can find out you can collect data right isn't this is so powerful right so i actually paused the course right um for a bit and then apparently there was an even better course but i didn't want to continue doing the courses right and i, I was going broke right i there was even a time true story uh i think this was right after that physical business was you know affected right there was a time for two weeks literally two weeks i would eat the gardenia wholemeal bread and water for two weeks okay. in my life and you're still running the the bread and mortar business the yeah DVD and shop. it was going down already okay and you see i have to pay for school right um pay i had for to pay cost. for my own expenses yeah i was giving some money as well to my parents so things were going down mm. I had, and i felt embarrassed as well because i i always wanted to just fend for myself so i felt, um, felt embarrassed to actually um, ask them for money right my mom was giving me some money initially but after that it didn't feel good because right. she knew what I was doing. Right. So I, I did that. But that also kind of helped me to be hungry. Hungry right. not just, you know, famished like physically, but what do I want to achieve? What do I want to create? Right. So I, as much as I was acting and hosting, I went into starting a business. Mm. So I just started it. I operated as a solopreneur as well. So right. I just 
my first goal is let me get a client. Let me get them some results. Let me get a client. So I didn't focus on like much on the design or the logo or even the brand. I just used my initial EAG. It's my name, right? Right. EG. So I used my initial as the brand and <laughs> I went out there. I cold called. Um, and surprisingly, my very first client was not from Singapore. Mm. My first client was from overseas. Then I started getting more overseas clients. Mm. And I had zero local clients. Right. Not a single customer here. Everyone was from overseas. And even my team, they were from different countries. Right. And it was initially, it was fun. It was exciting. I was getting money. I was able to have a team. I was able to build the culture. Everything was great. But after a while, I started to get quite tired. I right. started to feel quite tired because different time zones. Mm. Um, different management style, you know, maybe one employee is waking up at this time, another employee is waking up another time, it was very difficult, it was affecting the systems and processes. Right. Operations was also affected. Then um, I thought, okay, I am acting, I'm hosting, mm. right? That's what I was trained to do. And I'm running this digital business. Right. So what is the level up? Like, what can I do to get more more income, but also give more value. Mm. Then I realized I have to sacrifice one. Mm. So which one do I want to sacrifice? So I did some interest, I had some introspection, reflection, and then I decided to go with the business because mm. I enjoyed it. I was learning a lot, making a lot of mistakes, making, ha failing. Um, my energy, my emotions were always like up and down, up and down. Mm. And um, I went into full, full on into the business mm. for about, two to three years, just full on into it. Right. And when I decided to go into it, there were a few people that found out about me. Mm. They were like, hey, um, you know, I heard that you are in social media marketing. Why don't we meet and talk, f see if we can collaborate. Right. And I was probably one of the first, right? Maybe, I'm not sure, is it because I, I was from an arts background? Right. Creative background. Right. I was doing videos. Mm. No one was doing videos. Mm. The and which year was that? Uh, this was about two years ago, right? About two, two and a half years ago, right? So basically, I just took whatever I learned right. from arts and storytelling, expressing, being authentic, being vulnerable, and I fused it into business, right? And it's quite unheard of for mm. someone to do that. Mm. And my clients overseas were in healthcare and beauty, mm. and those videos yeah. were were made for the specific kind of. Uh, yes. needs of your clients. Yeah, so we will storyboard right. it, we will create blocking, the plot, right. the vision, everything. So it's, it's like, it's like yeah. healthcare, you, you make specific videos that yes. will help their business. Wow, okay. Yeah, yeah. Right. And it's unheard of because in the healthcare industry, um, in Singapore, it's the most restricted from right. language to being creative right. to the way you actually advertise and market. No sales, no promotions, no offer. Right. Um, and I was doing it and I was able to get them an ROI. So people who run businesses came to me and said, hey, um, why, not, why don't we collaborate? You have social media marketing. You have your branding experience. We have SEO. Mm. We have Google Analytics. Why don't we do something? Why don't right. we collaborate? So there were three in total that approached me. I decided to go with the last one. Right. And I did not expect to actually, you know, drop all my other clients and go full on into it. Right. Yeah, but I think there's like a quote, right? That goes something like, burn your... Burn your boat, burn your bridge, yeah, and, yes. yeah, and sail or something right, like that. I right, right. So I Chinese word, yeah, yeah. Is that a saying for it? Yeah, Chinese saying is like it's like burn your bridge and yeah, something something like, like that, yeah. right? Like right. basically, be willing to drop whatever you have if you believe in creating something and just go full on into it. Right, right. So that's what I did, and, and that's how Neo Three Sixty was formed. Yes, right. yes. So my my partner today, I mean, he's good. He's um, slightly different from me, a little bit more. Uh, low key, I would say. Right. Um, and he was the only one that really told me that he was talking more about value mm. and more about what our existing clients or future clients can get, not just revenue, profit, and how much we will benefit. Right. And he was telling me that I will have ownership to it. I can do what I want as well. Mm. We will talk about it. We will discuss it. And then we will make decisions together what is best for the agency. Mm. So yeah, after a few years, here we are now. Right, <laughs> yeah. right, it's great. Yeah, yeah this, this, I think that's a, that's a wonderful journey mm. that you had. I mean, all the way from uh, studying in the art school and then going to brick and mortar and then yeah. like a super transformation all the way from like, 
you know, no digital background mm. to digital mm. background. And and all these like <coughs> skill sets, were they all self learned and self taught? Like, you know, going to the digital space, learning about social media and yeah. all that kind of stuff. Were, were they all like self learned at all when you were like twenty years old and stuff like mm-hmm. that? Good question. So, um, I think it was really about taking action. Right. It was really about. So I have this friend, his name is Gary. He, he would definitely watch this, so big <laughs> shout out to him, Gary and Kenji and a few other friends as well. Right. They would always tell me, because they were in e-commerce mm. and they were younger than me. Mm. They were like only 18, I'm at, I was 23. Right. Right, and I just partnered up and they were telling me, uh, put, just pull the trigger. Mm. Like, yeah, you are going to partner up, you're gonna go together right. with another person and have this brand, but just keep doing, keep creating. Right. So I realized that Yes, I like the technical knowledge in SEO, which is search, right. and in Google Display, which comes under Display. But right. I wanted to learn, right. and right. I I learned it first, and then apply it to so right. experience. So even though there's a team, I constantly did it, right. constantly tried to enhance my skill, my abilities. Even till today, I mean, right. I I go to work early, I start my day early because I think that. Practicing is so important, being right. a practitioner. Right. Like knowing what are the changes, what is evolving, and how we can adapt to it as well. Right, yeah. right, right. And uh, yeah, I, I agree totally. I mean, like, um, I always tell my guys, you know, like, you know, NBA players, you know, they mm. are already so successful, but they're still practicing every single day. Mm. You know, it's like, uh, you know, the, the late Kobe Bryant, he's like, he, mm. he practices three to four rounds per day. So even though he's so good at his craft <coughs> already. So yeah, I totally agree. And, and, Actually, just now when you were talking about, you know, um, when you first saw the shift, you know, in the DVD business, yeah. when Netflix and Spotify came on board, and um, and I, I just had some re- um, you no know, recollection of the days that when me and Adrian, my business partner, that was about six years back, you know, we, we told ourselves yeah. like, hey, we are going to chop our hands. We are forever not going to throw physical flyers anymore because we, we have been doing that for the past like eight years, since 14 years ago, we, we have thrown yeah. Physical mailers and flyers for eight years, the and we just realized way. that yeah, the the ROI is just dipping. Mm. People's attention are just not there. Mm. It is not um, helpful anymore to sell properties in this manner. Um, and 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 when that six year mark, um, uh, when when the shift happened, what we mm. realized was that we really have to do something different, right? So. Which was why, like you know, three over years back, we we started off with the digital yeah. uh, video stuff and things like that, and and you started with the video as well. It was mm. about two years <laughs> back, and um, I mean, when we started like three in late twenty sixteen on our first video yeah. home tour, a lot of people thought that we were crazy. All right, they thought like you know, what are you guys doing all this, mm. all this you know stuff that that creates so much um, trouble. They, they 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 just had this mindset that. You're doing too many things to sell a property. You know, it's mm. too troublesome. You know, why, why are you going to di- going to that kind of extent to sell a property, mm. right? So mm. um, I, I think for, for Esmond yourself is that you, you took the leap and then yeah. you, you wanted to really um, go into a business that you think that will have a lot of longevity. And, mm. and I really like the fact that you said that, you know, you and your business partner, your co-owners, you all come from the value standpoint, wanting mm. to add value to your to your consumers yep. your yep. clients stuff like that right so i just want to understand a little bit you know so as a young person age 26 your yep. business owner the business is successful <coughs> um how do you view yourself as a millennial as a as a business owner and how, how do you view yourself owning a business running a business uh, being active as a practitioner in the business every day mm. and at the same time how do you see uh property ownership in singapore you know like do you aspire to to own property yeah. your your property for your own state? Do you aspire to own property, um, some properties for investment down the road as well? So mm. how, how do you view it? I mean, and, and what do you and your friends think about property ownership in Singapore? Okay, right. so for me, being a millennial and running a business, right, um, I think it's very easy to actually slip into the comfort zone, mm. look, become complacent, right, and. The comfort zone is the most dangerous zone because right. the moment you feel like, oh wow, I'm gr- I'm great, I've achieved all these things, things are growing, I'm making money, um, I have staff, I have an entire team that has got my back, everything is set in place. Right. Then you're stagnant, you don't grow, you don't right. progress. Right. And that's always on my mind. Mm. Like 
every single time we onboard a new client, a new brand, um, or we hire someone new. Today we are much bigger than we used to be. It's always about what are we really creating? Like mm. what is the vision? Right. What, what mission are we on? And it was always as well to change the way marketing is done, mm. the way digital marketing is done. Right. Um, we also focus on elevating the brand, building equity for brands. So it's not just about creating peak performance for marketing campaigns, getting them an ROI. Right. It's also about how do we keep the brand safe? How do we um, bring in new investors for them that believe in the brand or build a relationship that trust, that credibility, that intimacy between them and their target audience? Right. How, right. how do we keep them relevant to their, right. to their market? Right. Um, so I would say that yes, even though I may have achieved more, there's still a lot more to do, a mm. lot more to create, um, and it can progress. And yes, for the property, I do want to buy a property. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I, I think property is one of the best ways to invest, right. leverage as well. I'm not very familiar with the property market, the property scene, but I think the m people who are my age, whether millennials, Gen X, right. as they are growing and maturing, that's something they should look into because right. it's also changing. Like several years ago, you could buy a HDB and sell the HDB quickly. Mm. But now you have to wait for five years. Right. The age limit has changed. There's more restrictions, right? So you have to get into it at the right time or uh, tap into the right resources to mm. be able to really enhance knowledge first and then take the risk or do the right thing in property. So for me, yes, I do intend to invest. I'm just not really certain when yet. Right. But I would love to. If you're selling any <laughs> house at a low price, maybe, you know, you can let me know. I'll, sure. I'll buy it, then I'll get a huge sure, profit. Sure, <laughs> sure. What, what are yeah. you looking for? And um, do you mind sharing with our audience, like, you know, are you married or, you know, no. or you're looking for a bachelor home and stuff like that? Uh, maybe a mansion. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Uh, I would, I'm not married. Right. I'm single. Mm. Um, I intend to get a property so that I can, it will bring me some form of passive income, mm. s a stream of income. Right. Like I never really w wanted to spend money on things that I don't need. Right. Um, whether it be a car or even clothing, certain right. things. Like when I buy gifts for my mom, mm. for my loved ones, um, and probably like when I'm in a relationship, that's the only time I really just buy gifts, you know, treat meals and all that. But other than that, I'm a pretty simple guy, simple dude. Right. Um, I don't really see a point. So I always, you know, I watch a lot of um, documentaries. I listen to a lot of audio. I read a lot of books. And I always felt right. like I should buy these things right. um, through my passive income. Right. So that right. like it, I'm not touching the money that's coming from the business. It's just like passive. Right. And I'm going on a holiday. I'm relaxing. I'm doing whatever I want. I have fun. Right. through that so to me it's really about striking out that new passive income through real estate or some other form of right right that yeah. means making your money work harder for you and yeah make the money and let the money work hard <laughs> right, right yeah yeah yeah. right and uh what is what is your what is your um goal in terms of a timeline when are you planning to to start owning a property I don't know, man. You tell me <laughs> when when is a good time to... Sure, we're going to have coffee and talk about yeah. that a little bit more. And um, I think our audience, especially our younger mm. audience, or even audience in their 30s and stuff like that, or people planning to come out to start their own business and all that. Since, I mean, you guys are the digital marketing expert, right? So yeah. could you share with us a little bit more like, you know, what is the difference? What is the difference between like marketing and branding? What is, what is the key difference between these two items? Okay, right. so marketing is like finding out what a girl wants, right? <laughs> Asking her out on a date and right. telling her, hey, this is what you want. This is what I can give you. Right. Would you like to go out on a date with me? You reach out for her and see whether she engages with you. Right. See, branding is slightly above marketing. Branding is no longer what you say about yourself, but what she feels about you. Right. So she reaches out and she says, okay, let's go out on a date. And she holds your hand and she goes out on a date with you. Right. So that is the slight difference between marketing and branding, which is why if you think about it, if marketing is done correctly, digital marketing, mm. you can create fantastic ROI. Mm. You can drive tangible traffic, get generate quantity of leads, quality of the leads. Right. But at the end of the day, what, what kind of um, relationship are you building for the audience, for your customers? Right? right. What is the brand? Like, why should they believe in you, trust in you, talk about you, right. um, feel for you, stay with you? Right, right. Brand so, advocacy, so yeah. marketing is really about taking action. 
right? Yeah. Doing something that takes action. And, and if I hear correctly, your perspective of branding is really the kind of feeling that, yes. that the consumers have of your brand. Yes. Um, the yes. kind of trust factor. What, what do they relate to when they, mm. they see your brand? Yeah, the expression, the function, right. the relevancy. Because you see, today I specialize in the healthcare. Mm. And we have big brands that work with us in different industries. So there is trust and credibility here. Right. So the next step is what kind of results are we going to produce? What is the desired outcome we are giving to the brands? Right. And are we, are we able to also elevate their brand? Right. Um, so that's what attracts, I think, mm. you know, today the businesses. <coughs> it's like two cars, right. right? There is a Toyota and there is a Bentley. Right. Both cars get you to the same destination. Right. Different brands, different mm. experience. Right. So what is the experience? Why do people choose a Bentley right. and not a Toyota? Right. Even the person who drives the Toyota might be able to afford a Bentley. So it comes down to the choice. Like how are you what's the experience that you're giving them? Right. Even before they get into the car. Right. What is that experience? What do they perceive? What is the perception and the belief about the brand? Right. And then they experience you and they start to feel something about the brand. Right. Because right. you can give all the results you want. What if they don't like the way you work? What if they don't like your attitude? Right. So it comes down to all these things as well. Right. Yep. right. So branding is really um, that higher level kind of stuff mm. that, that takes time to build. Yep. Yeah. At the same time, I think time is also a factor. Mm. Right. So... Um, you know, I mean, the interesting thing is that, you know, businesses, so, so d for, for your point of view, do you think that all businesses in today's market will mm -hmm. need to embrace social media, digital marketing as part of um, their communication with, with their audience? And yeah, yeah do, do you think that it is definitely a staple food? It is something that is so important and it should be at the center of every business strategy? What do, what do you think? I think that social media marketing is still underrated to a certain extent. There right. are still a lot of friends and businesses out there that are doubting. Mm. And doubting is fine, but why not experience it first? Because right. social media is probably one of the most efficient way to create value for your audience. You're not waiting for them to search for you or um, find out about you. You are appearing in front of your target audience. You're right. telling them, hey, you know, you have been showing interest in all these things and here I am and would you like to experience me? And then you take them on a journey, right. on the buyer's journey, right? On an enjoyable journey and they get to choose and you can do so much with social media marketing. Right. You can create videos, you can have creative designs, you can reach out to them. You, you are being, think of like marketing as being proactive now. Right. So going from complacency <laughs> in digital marketing right. or in marketing in general to being efficient right. and showing that you truly care and you want to add value in their life and right. you're solving a problem. Right. It's a problem that they have, yeah. Yeah, and... So and a lot of brands should look into it. I mean, the fact that healthcare is getting into it quite big, you know? Healthcare mm. was never really an industry that was very creative, very... Right. And healthcare, yeah. you mean local healthcare? International, like many right. countries um, are going into it for healthcare. It can be anything from plastic surgery to aesthetic to any form of surgical or non-surgical as long as it's within healthcare. Right. Um, like right now, the coronavirus, you know, there are the infection diseases specialists, right. th those kind of like different services, anything under the healthcare, they are getting into it. So what more the brands like real estate or mm. lifestyle, fashion, mm. these kind of brands where you want to constantly be in the presence of your audience. Right. So yeah. that's where you want to be. Yeah. yeah. And, um, you know, like, uh, like, um, even until today, mm -hmm. uh, where we have, we have done like at Properly Bras, we have done like videos over the past three years, yep. and um, there's still you know like some colleagues asking us like, hey, does does home tours really work? You know, like I, I still get people coming up to me. I mean, who are real estate professionals, mm -hmm. and then they will come up to me and say that is the is the video home tour really working? Does mm. it really sell homes? Mm. And uh, I'm I'm just scratching my head like, you know, isn't isn't it obvious that it can sell home because just like what you have mentioned, marketing, um, in in my perspective, there's two um, definitions. One is a very passive form of marketing. One is a more active and aggressive form of marketing whereby you take action, very mm. proactive, 
and you create a content that's compelling, mm. engaging, entertaining, and then you you bring it up to the audience, you bring it up to the, the correct target audience and you bring them onto the journey, make things easier for them for selection and stuff. Mm. And exactly just what you have been talking about. You say that, you know, um, rather than waiting for people to search for you, you take a proactive approach yes. and search for that. And, and that's what we have been seeing for the past 10 years is like the search pattern of buyers that is looking for property is really based on um, the buyer's time, the buyer's um, own search criteria and and we always tell our clients like you know hey when we want to sell a property this property is like a million dollars a two million dollars three million dollars is, is even a hdb is like five six hundred seven hundred thousand dollars mm. and this is such a huge product that is immovable yeah you really need to put in the effort in marketing because you got to attract people to physically take time off and travel down to that property and view it, right? So we, mm. we can't bring the product to people, mm. right? So when uh, I hear uh, my my own uh, professionals, I mean, like in the real estate industry, asking me this question, I feel like <laughs> it, it works. Stop asking that question. <laughs> I just want to tell them it works. It works because, yeah. I mean, if not, we wouldn't have done like 500 over, over videos and yep, yep. And I think especially in the past 12 to 18 months, we have seen like um, out of the, the open houses that we have conducted um, in, in using both social media, uh, using our content and palm it towards Instagram, Facebook and YouTube. And mm. we are still using actually the search engines. We are mm. still using like the property portals platform and stuff. But we have seen like this space on social media, people actually physically coming to view properties is like close to 70% mm. that has been attracted to kind of view the property because of the video home tours and social media and stuff. Mm -hmm. And then this portion is about 30%. So um, I think it's really getting interesting in the social media space because yeah. I, I think the, the phone, I mean, where's my phone? Oh, my phone is over there. So, yeah. I mean, the phone is like where all attention are. Yes, and I totally yes, agree yes. that, you know, even healthcare, you, you need to grab people's attention. I was just reading like, Three days ago, there was this article. Was like, now our attention is so expensive. You know, like, mm. is is really an attention game? Um, mm. because we have so many platforms: WhatsApp, Facebook, Instagram. We have DMs. We have YouTube. We have TikTok. We have TikTok. We have um Facebook Messenger. Yeah. I mean, emails and search and stuff. And our mm. attention is so expensive. So. Yeah, so I, I think it's going to get really interesting and, and I totally yeah. agree with, with investment that, you know, all businesses should use social media as part of their business strategy. So how because, about... Yeah, because yeah, sorry, it's, a, it's a very simple thing. Right. It's easy, actually, to comprehend. Right. Where are your customers spending the most amount of time? Right. Are they in front of the TV? Once upon a time, broadcast media was one of the biggest. Right. Why do big brands like SIA or the banks or even the car brands, why are they on social media now? Because they right. realize that their customers, their target audience are on social media. They are during the lunch break, you know, when they are waiting for someone, they are scrolling through the phone, they're on the laptop. These are the devices where they are spending more time. Right. And there's a lot of distractions around. Right. So why not understand where your audience are spending their time in what time, which specific platforms? Is it LinkedIn? Is it Facebook? Right. What kind of services? And then test, right. test see which one is getting more traction, more results, and then reach to them. Right. Yeah. So you right. got to keep evolving, adapting to the new changes. Right. Yes. Right. And um, also, I, I think um, one very interesting thing is that we want to know about mm. um, yourself as a social media expert, right? It's like, um, what, are, what are some things and changes that you see in the upcoming 12 to 24 months, um, okay. especially in Singapore, in the social media space? What, what? Sure. So one big thing to look out for is right. when AI integrates more with social media or even search. So just digital marketing. When digital right. marketing combines much more with AI. Right. For instance, now SEO um, is starting to become voice search. Mm. Or Facebook Messenger and Facebook as a platform are able to detect certain things. So right. when AI gets bigger with digital marketing, when it integrates through technology, I think it's going to be huge, insanely amazing on the possibilities that businesses can achieve through through this. So digital is constantly evolving. It is a growing industry. Um, right. Digital marketing is also constantly changing. Now there's social media marketer. Oh, sorry, social media marketing. Right? Maybe mm. in the future, with, within the next twelve to twenty-four months, there might be another new thing that will come out, and this right. will be like 
I don't know, like social media AI or like AI, I don't know, something like that, right? right? And then it's really powerful. You can find out where exactly people are at. You can even like collect a lot of data. Right. So and and, and the strange thing is that we also notice that like voice is coming mm. up very strongly. Right? Yeah, that's what we're doing. <laughs> and that's what we're doing this podcast. Like, and, um, and then you, you mentioned like AI um, yep. using voice for search capabilities and yep. stuff. Why do you think voice is coming back? Is it because of our lifestyle, We're getting busy and typing has been like, you know, getting more tough and stuff like that? So as um, scary as it sounds, um, unless you cannot speak, right. what do human beings do a lot? We use our senses, we talk, right. we speak. So probably these technology companies or software companies, whatever the term is, they start to realize, oh wait, human beings are always talking. Like right now, your laptop is here. What if whatever we are talking about, like now the laptop knows that I'm interested to buy property. Right. I'm keen, but I'm, I'm not sure where. Right. So then the next time I go on social media, there's an ad that comes out and it's property Lean brothers or it's uh, <laughs> some other thing to do with real right. estate. Similarly, maybe you want to go to um, fitness mm. you, you want to go to the gym more regularly but you're looking for the best price the more suitable one and because you're talking about it then it sinks in somehow and the next time you go you see something that you want right so yeah it's scary but it's also great because it just shortens your time to search and right. waste time right and you can you can get what you want you're solving a need you're solving a problem right so right based on your living habits based yeah. on your preferences and stuff exactly so i think that's why voice is becoming a big thing, audio. Mm. And also because the truth of the matter is the consumer rate on television is dropping, declining a little bit. Mm. I'm not the expert, but mm. more people are spending time on the devices. Right. So besides video, audio is the next thing. Right. Because someone who is um, visually impaired, mm. they cannot see, mm. but they can listen. Right. Right? They, they can listen to the audio, they can learn new things, they can realize the opportunities out there, the resources and tap into it. So it's really about solving problems, solving problems, solving problems. Right, yeah. right. It's That's always great. about that. That's great. And coming to mm. that, um, mm. about solving problems, like mm. um, we want to ask you a little bit about your personal side. Sure. Right. So, okay. Um, your research, <laughs> your, your in-depth research. <laughs> right. So, so as been share with us, like, you know, um, as a as a business owner, as yep. an entrepreneur, what has been like you know one of the most uh difficult period uh, in your life? You know, like something that you have overcome in the past, mm. and um, like yeah, just share with us like you know what has been one of the most difficult period. Sure. Right. So when I was doing the, you know, the physical business, right, and mm. I was still in La Salle, um, well, actually started when I was in secondary school, so I was in. Athletics, right. right? The boxing and thing. Yeah, boxing and athletics. Right. Um. So, athletics was track and field in school, and then boxing like secretly behind my parents' back. But basically, high intensity activities and right. always under the sun and training and all. So my vision used to be blur sometimes. Your vision. Yeah, my sense of sight was right. blur. Right. Um. I thought it was normal. Oh, you know, it's normal. I'm, I was the only one in my family that did not have to wear spectacles. I had perfect vision, very okay. clear. Okay. But by the time I was about 19, 20, it started to decline. So I thought, once again, it must be because of my lifestyle. It's mm. really busy. Um, I don't sleep much. I'm a light sleeper. And I was thinking, what's happening? So I went to get a check. Mm. And the uh, doctor is... So it's like constantly blur. From, it was degenerating. So it was okay. like from blur, it was becoming more grainy. Oh. Then there was a little bit of static. Okay. Yeah. So I started realizing that this is not normal. So I told my parents about it. Right. And then I left school already. I left La Salle and I was still doing that physical business and I had to transit into the next stage, mm. which was the digital. Mm. And that's also when this started to go down. So you see, business just went down, right? Mm. My physical business just went down mm. and my vision, like my sense of sight was also getting affected. Mm went to the doctors, mm. um, got myself checked, and every the doctors, the eye doctors said that my eyes are fine, my cornea, my retina, everything is fine. Mm. But when they did PET scans, certain right. scans that they did with electronic and all that, they said that there was a, the two tubes that connect the two brains to the two eyes, right. something wasn't right there. Okay. Something was irregular. Okay. But they couldn't say concretely what was happening. Mm. So eventually, um, I still remember this doctor. His name is Dr. Clement Tan. He's the head of department in 
uh, I think the neuro ophthalmology department at NUH, and he also happened to be at MMI. So if you have served NS, mm. the Military Medicine Institute, he was like the overall in charge. Right. So right. he has a lot of experience, and he told me that he has seen two, I think one or two people like that before me, and he said this is very rare. Mm. It is basically like a camera. Mm. The lens is clean. It's beautiful. It's nice, but the transmitter inside something is weird. There, something is not working. Mm. So finally, I had awareness on what's happening, but there was no medicines, con- like exact, precise medicines that could cure it. Mm. And remember, I was in acting. I was in acting, and I was in. I was hosting. So <laughs> the script. So these things started to affect me. I couldn't act much. Couldn't host much. Things were going down. I'm not sure what's happening. Business going down. My sense of sight is getting affected. No mm. medicines yet. And then. Um, unfortunately, my parents went their separate ways. They decided to divorce as well. Mm, sorry. So everything was it was really a dark time, right? Everything is like kind of going down. My personal life, my professional life, my you know business, everything was going down, and I couldn't understand like why is this happening to me? Mm. Because I'm a I believe in God, and you know I'm big on the universe and like all this energy and like doing more, creating more. Um, so I, I couldn't understand. And then one day I woke up and it was so bad. My vision was so bad. There was so much of static that mm. I couldn't see. Mm. So I was shocked. I didn't know what to do. And I just started the digital agency on mm. my own. And I went back to the same doctor, had an appointment, and they said that, yeah, it's degenerative. We have, there's no guarantee that you might get your sense of sight back. So maybe you have to, we, we have to con- confirm all these um, symptoms that you have, put it in paper, um, diagnose you and then you have to go to the Singapore Association for the Visually Handicapped and mm. I was like what? couldn't really comprehend certain things I also started to feel very insecure and my self esteem was going down badly mm. because how can a guy that was in sports that was always out there that was a captain that was a leader that was in acting and hosting in front of the camera how could this happen to him? Right. and I couldn't think of something bad that I did I didn't cause much I didn't cause much problems for my parents and I was always empathetic, always giving. Right. So I, I went to reluctantly, um, they sent me to the associa- Association for the Visually Handicapped. So it's basically called SAVH. Right. It's at Caldi Court um, MRT. Right. And I, I remember I went there and I was devastated. I, it wasn't so bad that I had to use a cane, but within the mm. next three months, I had to start using the cane. Mm. So I had to learn Braille, I had to learn NVDA, which is non-desktop, non-visual desktop SS. Um, mm. I had to start using a cane. I became, I started, I, I wasn't eating much. I was losing weight. I didn't shave. My parents were going through a divorce. I was like, what else was going on? It was the most depressive moment in my life. I broke down for the first time in my life. I was in a relationship. That broke down as well. Mm. Oh yeah, I just remembered. So I was in a relationship mm. right with a girl and that broke down as well. Mm. And um, everything was basically breaking down, breaking down, breaking down, breaking down. And f- by God's grace, the doctors basically found out that my condition is basically in between extreme migraine with aura and some form of epilepsy. I do not have epilepsy, but mm. the medications might be able to treat my condition. Mm. So they tried a few, and then finally there was one particular set of medication. One of it was topiramid. Mm. Yeah, if I remember it correctly, it's like a yellow box and a few other medi- medicines. Um, and I was taking all these medicines, and I was going to the SAVH. I right. was... Um, yeah, it was probably the most depressive dark moment in my life. And mm. then it took several more months. I started to recover. And when I started recovering, because I was always on the non-visual desktop SS. Right. You see, that's why it's also connected. Like, right. that also made me... I, I learned a lot during that time. So, yes, to answer your question, that was the most depressive moment in my life. Like, right. it was so dark. Like, I was losing my family. I was losing my relationship. I was losing finance. I was going blind. I had no idea when this was going to come back. And, and that was like when you were age 20. Yes. Right. Yes, yes. Yes. Right. 20. Yeah. 20, right. 21. Right. In fact, it took some time, right? So even at 22, 23, when things got better, it wasn't like 100% mm. I could be under light, mm. right? And um, that's also why if you notice, like when you used to bump into me at those areas, sometimes I'm wearing shades. Mm. Sometimes in the office when it's bright, I also wear shades. I wear mm. sunglasses. Right. Or when it gets a little bit glaring, I try to wear some things that would reflect light away. I'm right. just very careful. I don't do intense, uh, minimize all the sports, all any form of activities that would, you know, get my neurons way more overactive than it 
has to be. Right. Yeah, I just take responsibility for myself. Yeah, I take a lot of precautions. Yeah. Now I'm off med medicines. Right. So that's right. good. Yep. Right. Well. Wow. Mm. So, wow. Thanks. Thanks for sharing with us about yep. that that period in your time and sure. like um. So those that was like for about nine months to a year for for yes, that entire period. Yes. Easily, easily nine months to a year. Right. Right. And um, how, how do you overcome it? You know, like while you're recovering from the medicine <coughs> and stuff, like. What what other things do you do? You know, I was actually depressed and mm. quite suicidal in mm. the sense that all of a sudden, when you cannot see right, and you can only rely on your senses, and you don't know when you're gonna get it back, mm. and you're losing your family, you're losing a relationship, you're losing money, and you're lost. You don't know when it's gonna come back, and you feel so dejected. You feel mm. like, what's the point of living, mm. right? And I was having suicidal thoughts. The only sense of motivation to me was if there are people who have no limbs, mm. no hands, no mm. legs, or they were born this way and they are still moving forward in mm. life, they are still taking all these challenges, all these struggles, and they keep moving forward. Mm. What if I could do it? Mm. And because my parents were divorcing during that period of time, I thought, hey, what if I can be the support, the pillar of strength for my mom? Mm. Right, because my dad went a separate way. My mom, my mom, they you know they had their own issues. So I, I, th I thought, why not be the strength for others mm. and use use this. So it took a long time. It wasn't easy at all. It mm. all came down to the mindset, to right. the b the beliefs. Because there was a period of time I told myself, okay, I'm never gonna get my sense of sight back. Is it a die or go do something and figure it out? Mm. And when I was in um. SAVH when I was there I met mm. a couple of people who were blind mm. and they were married they had children mm. and they were still doing some form of work like there's this man um, his name is Victor mm. he's cops art mm. if you go to some hospitals or even like buildings certain buildings have has his art mm. he has his own studio and that's what he does for a living he's blind he cannot see and he's married he has children so I realized oh so it doesn't matter like mm. you can actually still live Maybe there are some lessons that I will learn from it. Right. So I right. convinced myself to believe that I can learn from all these things and propel forward. Yep. Right. So so now that mm. um, you have recovered and then now it's like six years later, what is yeah. your um, what is what is what is one thing that you always you know uh, tell yourself like your your core outlook for life? You know what is what is something that you always will remind yourself that you know hey there's there's been one of my most difficult period, you know. Um, how, how do you yeah. always remind yourself to have, you know, like gratitude or stuff like that? You know, what's one thing that, that is in your belief system now? I think if you wake up mm. and you have a life, you have a heart that is beating, a brain that can think, and you have all your senses that is intact, or at least most of them, right. that itself is a huge blessing that there are many people out there that do not have. Right. So how are you going to use this to create value for yourself mm. and take care of yourself and create value for others and take care of others? Right. I'm not saying that everyone has to th think that way, mm. but how do you strengthen one another? How do you understand each other's pain mm. and experience instead of putting them down, instead of shaming them, instead of mocking them, right. instead of um, judging? Right. Because you don't know what people has gone through. Like right. the only reason you you know about this is because of research or because you have heard from me. You know whatever I'm doing, mm. etc. And um, you never know what has happened to someone. So listen to them and see how you can help them. Mm. Yeah, don't mm. don't put them down. Right. Yeah, you wanted to see this, right? So I thought of showing right. it to you. So that's my that's like the ID for people who have been blind. Right. If you were blind right. in your life or you have right. some form of um, handicap mm. situation you will be given an id it's like an ic for the people who are right. handicapped like right. sg enable gives cards sorry gives cards to um for transport and all these things as well right so this is also something i should have um just as a precaution yeah and yeah we talked about it and i thought right. yeah I, I sh it'd be pretty cool to show you because i know your journey you know my journey so that's right great. yeah right thanks for sharing thanks for sharing yeah, and uh, I, I think it's it's great that you know like um there's so many dots that has been connected in your yes, life you know yes, like yes. even though you're very young <coughs> now and um, i think what you're doing is great and um i i love the business that you're doing is is adding value to the marketplace and stuff mm. yeah so Thank you. um 
maybe before we end, uh, why don't why don't you just share with our audience like you know what is, what is one thing you know now yeah. now it's twenty twenty, uh, especially for young people, uh, young people that is planning to probably start their own business, all right, or maybe to yeah. come out as a solopreneur in whatever profession. Mm. Uh, what is one advice you know as a young person coming out to strike it on their own? Mm, what advice for them to 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 have a success and and to have a viewpoint that. Uh, to have longevity in business and stuff. Sure. Right. Will I look at this camera or? No, uh, look at the center one. Yes. Oh, this one. <laughs> right. This one. Oh, okay. Yes. This one. Yes. Okay. Cool. Right. So I think um, awareness is so important because mm. if you're not aware of your identity, of your self belief, your self image, your worldview, like what you want, who you are as a person, right. what are your strengths, what are your weaknesses, if you're not aware of all these things, it's gonna take you longer mm. to grow, mm. and you also have to come to terms with your weaknesses mm. uh, minimize the weaknesses minimize the negativity and focus on exercising the the positivity right the, what you can do to create for yourself and for others and i think for students for the millennials and the gen x right i'm like them as well i think f as much as you are focusing in school mm. also focus on skills mm and abilities. So skills are something that you can learn and you can pick up and you can you know, grow and hence become stronger in it. And abilities are, it doesn't mean that if you studied and trained in this, mm. this is what you're gonna do in your life. Like mm. look at me, I was from sports, I was in arts, I was doing acting, I was doing hosting, I went into business, I'm doing business, I wouldn't have thought about it. So figure out where is your potential, mm. explore. Mm. Try everything when you're young. Mm. I, I'm blessed in the sense that certain dark moments in my life were the moments that really gave me breakthroughs, mm. right? Sometimes the most painful experience could be that the experience that makes you become strong. So also focus on that. I know a lot of students out there are stressed by school, whether you're in you know, high school, secondary school or college or university right now. There's a lot of pressure mm. in academics. Mm. Um, figure out what you can do to relax, to unwind, what you can do to feel better right. to you know, pace yourself to grow. And if they're intending to start a business, mm. I think have in mind what, it, what interests you, mm. what are you passionate about? True passion might lead to your purpose. Right. And does it give you income and does it also change the world in the marketplace? Mm. And yeah, take action, keep taking action, keep evaluating what worked, what did not work, keep moving forward and always, always, always enrich others, strengthen others. Don't just lift yourself up, you know? If right. you know someone that needs some help, guide them, lead them. Like right now is the coronavirus. Are you gonna ask me something about that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, about no, that. But yeah. anyways, yeah, it's a time where everyone is fearful, yeah. right? Yeah, Students, adults, it whoever. Is. Instead yeah. of operating from fear and, you know, starting to think negatively, Operate from faith. Like, mm. we got through SARS, we got through H1N1, we got through recessions. Mm. This is not here to stay. The coronavirus is not here to stay at all. It will go off. It's just a matter of when. Mm. So, use this time to take a step back and mm. think about your life, your personal life, and your professional life, and mm. see how you can improve. It's actually one of the best times while things are a little bit slow mm. to recalibrate, to right. do a, for business people, brand audit or uh, some form of work audit for students your own self check. Right. Maybe your relationship didn't work out or maybe something didn't work out and you want to use this time to really have some introspective time. Reflect, reflect. Right. Yeah. Right. So always be positive and empower yourself and mm. empower others. Mm. Yeah, and I yeah. think what what I hear from Esben is that also to have um mm. you talk a lot about empathy. Empathy about for yeah. other people because empathy is key. Yeah, because we we'll, we we'll, we always um also share with our associates like you know everybody is in a different life stage and um try not to compare yourself with another person because mm. we're just in so different life stages. You know, some some people could be going through a rough time and stuff like that. So success is not really about you know just just about sales and mm. and performance all the time. Is also really about relationships and and um, how how do you see yourself compared with yourself one year back, you know? I, th I think if you have grown over the past one year, past three years, yep. that is success, right? So um, thank you so much, es Esmond. Yep, and I, I think this session has been great. It's, it's a one hour podcast. It's, there's so much meat in there. And um, there's yeah, a bite lot on that meat. <laughs> yeah. There's a lot of things on social mm. media, marketing, branding, um, <coughs> his story is empowering yep. and, 
thank you so much for coming here, sharing with us your story and your difficult moments. And also I think um, it, this can definitely encourage a lot of people, especially the young people sure, sure. Uh, that watches uh, our podcast. And once again, thank you for coming on to our Properly Lim Brothers podcast. And uh, my name is Melvin Lim. I'm very honored to have uh, Esmond, my friend, thank here you. with us. Yep. And uh, we'll see you again. All right. Thank you. Cheers. Oh,